This morning, my message is entitled, Weapons Mighty in God. We're going to be looking at the first six verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And would you please join with me as we pray and commit this time to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for the power of Your Holy Spirit that moves mightily in Your people. And Lord, I ask today, God, as we have entered Your courts with praise, as You inhabit the praises of Your people, that now Your Holy Spirit would move among us. That You would give us ears to hear what Your Spirit would say. And Lord, I pray that You would uplift us, that You would refresh us, and that You would strengthen this body, Lord, Your body. That You would minister according to Your perfect knowledge of everything that's going on with every person that is here today. I ask, Lord, that counseling would take place through the Word of God. I ask, Lord, that wisdom would be given through Your Word. And Lord, now we ask that You would add Your blessing to the reading and to the study of Your Holy Scriptures. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. So today we're going to glean a valuable insight to the life of Paul and the responsibilities that he carried constantly in regards to the well-being of the church. But not only that, we will also gather some valuable information regarding the type of spiritual warfare that we face as Christians and the means by which we may find ourselves victorious in that warfare. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, no one likes to lose. Now, some people may dislike losing more than others, but generally speaking, we do not like losing. And I believe the sentiment is the same when it comes to losing spiritual battles. I don't know if you've noticed this lately, but it seems that there have been so many attacks against the church just in general. We've seen families under attack and marriages under attack. Individuals being overrun by the lusts of the flesh and sinful desires. Now, if we look back on our own lives over the course of our own lives, we've all lost a battle or two and it's not a good feeling. Hopelessness is not a good feeling. See, without Jesus, we are without hope. And if we do not have hope, then we live disappointed and dejected lives. Our minds really are the battlefields of life because those battles are fought and either won or lost in our thoughts. The actions of our lives follow suit with the thoughts that are in our minds. And if we repeat an action long enough, then the time needed to process the thought connected to that action becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. Meaning that by the time we've traveled down a particular road of action, we've become so accustomed to certain actions that they seemingly become involuntary don't even have to think twice about it. We may not even realize at that point how abnormal our evolving new normal has become. We find that habits dictate our thoughts and then our actions as well because we've been under their control for so long. The Bible calls this being under the control of the lust of the flesh. And the only thing that comes from being under the control of the lust of the flesh is corruption. Sin corrupts our thoughts. Sin corrupts our emotions. Sin corrupts our marriages. Sin corrupts our relationships with other people. Sin corrupts us to the core. And this is why we see terrible things taking place in the world. This is why we see Christians not able to take control over the flesh because they're overrun by the thoughts in their minds that turn into actions because they never took those thoughts captive and subjected them to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in their lives. And Paul this morning, as we're going to be looking at this passage of Scripture, is going to be addressing this very issue with the Corinthian Christians here in chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Point number one this morning is this, the power of the flesh. I just have two points for you this morning. Point number one, the power of the flesh. Verse one, 2 Corinthians 10 says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold towards you. Paul leads off this section of his letter addressing Really indirectly, the accusations against him being the type of guy that talks real big, tells other people what they should be doing, or in this case, writes real big, 
to the church in Corinth, but cowers in the presence of those he would be writing to. I would just like to say right off the bat on this subject that meekness does not equal weakness. I've come to discover more and more how challenging it can be to be a pastor of a church filled with people that you care about. Because when they hurt, you hurt. When they struggle, you struggle. Quite frankly, my my job would be so much easier if I didn't care about any of the people. Those that are in places of spiritual authority are not to be lauding over people, but rather exercising the philosophy of ministry that Jesus had. One of meekness, one of gentleness, and one of servanthood. Meekness and gentleness should be hallmarks of our Christian faith. So Paul, the spiritual authority, was pleading with meekness and gentleness in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 28, he said, Besides the other thing which comes, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily is my deep concern for all the churches. A person that is in a place of spiritual leadership has a concern for the well-being of the church. They're not cold, they're not hard-hearted, they're concerned for the spiritual well-being. Are they living in sin? Are they returning to idolatry? Are they having problems in their marriage, marriages? Are they having issues with their kids? Were they battling diseases? And when you love people, you cannot help but be concerned with them. Yet though Paul had every right to exercise authority, he pleads with them humbly. In verse 2 it says, I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. There were those in the church that were accusing Paul of being in the flesh. I don't know if you realize this or not, but you can be lowly and bold. You can be humble and bold. You can be humble and speak the truth with power. There were some in the church that questioned Paul's authority. And he's writing to them saying, I'd rather not have to come in boldness and come down hard upon you because of your rejection of what is right. Rather, he'd wish that they would shape up on their own and that he wouldn't have to intervene. And really, that's the desire for any pastor. And if you come to a Calvary Chapel, you are going to get teaching through God's Word. And some of us may not like that. We may not like the fact that a lot of counseling takes place through the pulpit because the Word of God is being taught and and issues that need to be addressed are addressed. But a pastor that cares about his church will teach the whole counsel of God. And you'll either love it or you'll hate it, but you'll know what the truth is. See, people that work out their own relationship with the Lord and do what is right to begin with is where we all want to be. Often, the actions of others put those in spiritual authority in a very tough place where they have to because of their responsibility before God. Where they have to exercise boldness in correcting those that are in error in the body of Christ. And no one likes that job. Nobody wants to have to go and correct somebody. We would much rather have everyone look to God's Word and say, Lord, what does Your Word say about this and apply it to my life? Help me to apply it to my life. Paul writes that he has every intention to be bold towards those few that are in need of correction. He would especially correct those that said that Paul walked after the lusts of the flesh. And this is a very serious deal here because a lot of times pastors can be criticized for speaking the truth boldly. I don't know if you realize how blessed you are to attend a church where the Word of God is proclaimed boldly and with power. Because that's not the case for a lot of churches in our country today where you actually read through the Bible. You know, a lot of times in churches it can be, how many of you have your Bibles here today? Would you hold them up? And you hold them up. If you have it on your phone, that's great. And they'll say, okay, put it under your seat because you won't be using that today. We actually look through God's Word and read it in hope and hope and pray that you outside of these four walls will say, Lord, speak to me through Your Word. There are those that are in the church today 
that would rather smear the church and blaspheme the name of Jesus than to admit what they're doing is wrong and that they need to change. They do not submit their lives to the authority of God's Word, and thus they reject anyone exercising such authority for correction. The power of the flesh is stronger than any of us. And if we think that we can control the power of sin in our lives by any other means than our complete dependency upon the Holy Spirit, we are a destroyed people. In Ephesians 6.12 it says, and you know it well, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. There's a spiritual battle that we are facing and that we are in every single day. You can't fight this in your own strength. You know, just a couple weeks back now, my kids were having a really rough night sleeping. I have three. My oldest son, Hudson, who is nine. My daughter, Ava, who is seven. And then I have little baby Harrison, who just turned one. You know, we joke about the fact that my wife and I just hated sleeping so much we decided to have another child. And we did. And it's one of those things where all parents go through it. And as our forefathers did, so must we. And we were finally in that place where my oldest son, man, he's a great sleeper. My daughter, she's sleeping through the night. And even the baby's starting to sleep through. And I don't know if you parents have young kids or if you have kids that are grown. Maybe you can remember back. I know some of us are probably still going through counseling after what we've gone through with our children. But... I remember one night in particular after we had slept for a couple weeks and you know how hard it is once your body starts getting used to sleeping to start waking up again. And my son woke up and I'm going, what in the world? Okay, are you okay? Go into his room and are you okay? Yeah, yeah, he had a bad dream. And then my daughter wakes up and so she wants me to lay by her and so I'm laying by my, my, my daughter in her bed. And then as I'm laying in my, in my daughter's bed with her, uh, I hear my son bolting down the hallway to our room. And then I'm going, what in the world? So I get up out of bed after you know, finally getting her to sleep. And then I go into to my bed to go to sleep. And then my son is in my spot, in my bed. And I'm like, son, what's going on? So I carry him and I put him back into his bed. And then just about 4.30 in the morning, my youngest baby now wakes up. And I hadn't been in my bed yet. And I'm sitting there. And in my house, I have a two-story with a ledge, you know, and, and, and I'm just leaning over it. And I'm going, and I was contemplating jumping. No, I'm just kidding. But it was, I was at that place where I, I'm just going, Lord, I'm starting to lose it. My personality is when I don't sleep, I don't do well. And, I, and I, I'm like, Lord, please. And I could feel like small explosions going off inside. And I remember just praying. I'm like, Lord. Please help me. I mean, talk about confessions of a pastor this morning, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, Lord, please help me. Please help me. And I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart that I needed to pray. As I was ping-ponging from one kid's room to another, and my wife was tag-teaming with the other kids, you know, and we're up all night. I'm going, what in the world? This is not the type of party that I want to have not stopping until four in the morning. And I felt like I had just had it. And I prayed, Lord, would you please help me? And I felt like the Lord put it on my heart. I said, Lord, I just pray that you would rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name that is causing this because I felt that it was a spiritual thing. And I'm not saying that every time your child wakes up at night, it's demonic activity, okay? But I'm just saying for me, I just needed to pray for that. And I said, Lord, would you please, please, bind the enemy, rebuke the enemy. And the next day, my oldest son, Finally went to bed, and the next day I woke up. And of course, that was Saturday night, and I was supposed to teach the next day. Hudson told me that he had a dream that that night that there was a lion in the house. And he said, Daddy, there was this lion in the house. It was so crazy. You know, he said, I saw like this weird ghost thing in our kitchen. And he said, there was a lion in our home. And he said, Daddy, then you just picked up the lion and you threw it out of the house. And I said, oh, really? Tell me more about this story. <laughs> Little did Hudson know that in 1 Peter 5.8 it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
By God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, that prayer fought against the enemy and won. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So for Paul the Apostle to be accused of living his life controlled by the flesh would be rebutted as absolutely ludicrous. How can you live after the lust of the flesh and find victory over the flesh? The answer is, you cannot. The enemy, the devil, is looking for whom he can destroy. He'll play the short game. He'll also work the long con. And that's with one goal in mind. To bring you and me to complete ruin. In Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. I want you all to notice this morning how thoughts are connected directly to how you live. And the cyclical nature of how you live is directly related to your thoughts. You become deceived and you believe the lies of Satan attacking you in your mind. And then those thoughts in your mind translate into emotions and feelings and desires and then how can I carry this out to action? So maybe you're wondering, how are we to live here on this earth and in these physical bodies when the battle needs to play, take place in the spiritual realm? How do I do that? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Because point number two this morning is the might of our God. And Paul says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, walking in the flesh in this verse 3 is to be differentiated with walking according to the flesh or walking after the lusts of the flesh. Paul here is acknowledging that he has a physical body and, and he's acknowledging that his physical body, just like your physical body, is involved in a spiritual battle. We may live in the natural world, but the attacks against him, even as they are against you as a follower of Jesus, are from a supernatural world. Christians are getting picked off left and right. Marriages are falling apart all over the place. People that you would never in a million years have dreamed that they would have marriage issues are getting divorced. People are ruining their lives because they're not able to overcome the attacks of the enemy against them. They're falling. And it's grievous that we're not gaining the victory in our minds. Paul said he does not war in the natural against a force that is supernatural. All too often, Christians will rely upon physical means to overcome in a spiritual battle. And he says in verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Strongholds. A spiritual stronghold is referring to a very strong fortress for sin and the flesh to operate out of. These areas are areas of our lives that over time we've built up and we have fortified through our thoughts and our actions. There could be strongholds in cities. Referring to powerful spiritual forces, as the Bible calls it, principalities that oversee particular areas in the world. As you know this, different countries have different spiritual entities overseeing them. Different areas, different counties, different cities have different spiritual hosts operating in that area. As a Christian, we must realize that we cannot fight in a spiritual battle with weapons that are carnal. Paul says, we do not have weapons that are carnal, but they're spiritual. The weapons we have at our disposal are prayer and the Word of God. Prayer and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word. These weapons are mighty in God, and you have them. They have power, they have influence, and they, have, they are used to destroy and to demolish any fortified place of sin, no matter what it is. These are the weapons that we have. You know, we may think, hey man, I just need to get myself together. I just need to get myself together. You know, it's just mind over matter, mind over matter. You know, don't raise your hand, please. 
But how many of you are controlled or influenced by thoughts that you wish that you didn't have? Just think about that for a second. How many of you have been deceived by your perception of reality and wish that we were not? Wish that you were not. Think about that. See, as I think, I act. But one of the great things about gathering together as the body of Christ and opening God's Word is that there are some of us today that are going to recognize an area of our life that is a stronghold of the enemy. And that stronghold needs to be demolished. It needs to be destroyed. See, the power of our spiritual weapons cannot be matched by anything. It cannot be matched by other people's lies or manipulation. It cannot be matched by slander or deception. These weapons that you have as a follower of Jesus are mighty for destroying the enemy before he destroys you. In verse 5 it says, these weapons are for casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Our weapons in God cast down spiritual strongholds, arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against God. Everything. Today, Worldly thinking is a stronghold in the life of a Christian. The enemy may plant thoughts in our heads about someone or about something. And then we start visualizing what it would be like to maybe be with that person or to be in that position. And even it would seem that our subconscious could start making plans on how we're able to achieve those things that we've been thinking about. Thoughts that contradict God and His Word contradict the truth. Thoughts that contradict God and His Word are contradictory to what is truth. Arguments, it says here, really are imaginations. Lofty things that are centered around ourselves, our own wants, and our sinful desires. Things that exalt themselves to be in the position of God in our lives. In that they control us. We serve them. We become consumed by these thoughts. And they warp us. And we can't let them go. We, we, we've become completely changed by them. Thoughts that would remove us from what we know to be true about God and His Word and replace it with something else. Replace God's Word in your life with a lie from Satan. This is why at the very beginning and every time after that you need to take every thought captive and subject it to the Lordship of Jesus in your life. Don't claim those thoughts that pop into your head. They're not your own. They're fiery darts of the wicked one. They're meant to consume the way that you think. They're meant to bring you down, to lead you astray, to go in the opposite direction of where God would be calling you. These fiery darts of the wicked one are meant to not only control your thought process, but eventually to control your actions. Where you lose your temper where you say those horrible things, where you do those things that are against God. And see, Satan knows that if you live according to the flesh, you will be destroyed. You will be destroyed. Practically, when a thought pops into your head, you need to ask yourself how that thought pertains to Jesus Christ being your Lord and Savior. How does this thought that is in my mind line up with Jesus as my Lord and Savior and what God's Word says? 
Is this thought going to lead me to an act of obedience or disobedience to the Lord? You have to ask yourself that question because thoughts can be so powerful. And the more, more that we stew over them, analyze them, think upon them, the more powerful they become. And it affects every area of our life. And it's only a matter of time as you wrestle with these things in your own strength that they make themselves known on the outside. It can be subtle or it can be blatant. But it is true that if you have the thoughts and you do not dismiss them or subject them to Jesus Christ as your Lord or hold them up to the really the test of what is truth and what is a lie, which is God's Word, those things will, they will absolutely skew the way that you view life and the way that you live. Ask yourself, are my thoughts placing me in opposition to the Lord? Are they? Because if they are, then that is from the enemy. That is from Satan. See, a wrong heart or thoughts left unchecked, no matter how well they are hidden, will eventually reveal themselves. You might be able to keep it cool for a little while. But sin cannot be compartmentalized. Sin doesn't just want one little area of your life. It wants everything. It wants the whole thing. The whole thing. There's so much worldly thinking in the church today about everything. And there's nothing more contrary to the wisdom of God than the wisdom of the flesh. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The church, we need to be careful. The church needs to be careful. Because we are allowing our emotions and our own thoughts on matters to dictate to us what we think God should believe and what God should say is true. Hey, if I don't feel that this is really something that I agree with, with what God's Word says, then I'm just going to tear this page out and I'll, I'll believe the things that I'm comfortable with and then I'm not going to accept the things that I'm not comfortable with. And then who ends up being the authority on what's right and wrong in this world? Is it God? No, it's you. Because you know better, because of your cultural context, what should be acceptable to God and what should not be acceptable to God. We need to be careful of that because that is a plague in the church today. Where we are throwing out God's Word and we're allowing society to tell us how we should be living. That's not right. That is not right. In verse 4 again, he says, For the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. You're fighting a spiritual battle. Don't fight in the flesh. Fly, fight in the spirit. He says they're not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Take those thoughts captive. Remember how I said that the more we, we do something, the shorter the time is for us to connect the thought to the action where it's just like, wham, there I said it. I didn't even think about it. It just came out. Wham, there I did it. I didn't even have a chance to process this. I just, it was just what I've always done. That's a stronghold. That's an operational base for the flesh to conduct its business. Those things need to be torn down in our own lives. And then also, if you're dealing with somebody that's in the flesh or you're having this, this situation where you're wrestling with something that is greater than what it looks like on the surface, you need to know that your weapons are not carnal. They're spiritual. They're not weak. They're strong. Enter into the spiritual battle through prayer and God's Word. Take those thoughts captive. Don't claim them as your own, but recognize those thoughts are contrary to the truth found in God's Word. The foundational truth of any time we have ever 
found ourselves in a bad place is because we as Christians have veered away from God's word. That's it. If you look back on anything in your life, whether it was the other person or you, and you find yourself in a situation, somebody's not living according to God's word. That's it. This is the direction for life. This is what shows you what is truth and what is a lie. This is what you hold on to when you're wrestling in the spiritual realm with things that are so far beyond you that are meant to consume you, to depress you, to oppress you, to discourage you, to get you to quit, to get you to drop out, to get you to say those things and do those things that are against God that have a collateral effect of damage. You've got to be careful because it starts right here in your mind. That's the battlefield right here. So if I recognize, Lord, I know this isn't of you because I know what your word says. You've not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I recognize that. Lord, fear not. I'll never leave you. You say you'll never forsake me. Thank you, Lord, for that. Wait a second. I'm starting to lose my temper, and I really feel like giving this woman a piece of my mind. Listen, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You hold on to those things. Lord, I'm too weak. I don't think I can make it through this. No, what does God's word say? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Lord, this is the most difficult situation I've ever found myself in. What am I to do? Oh, I know all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. I hold on to those truths. Lord, I feel like you hate me because I've sinned. Well, no, the Bible says if you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Lord, I'm feeling prideful right now because, you know, man, I, I, I'm, I'm getting the promotions in my job and, you know, I've made a lot of money and, you know, I'm pretty, pretty powerful where I'm at. The Lord says in Jeremiah 9, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his strength. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let he who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am God, exercising loving kindness righteousness and judgment on the earth for in these I delight says the Lord you hold on to the things that are found in God's word so you recognize the attacks of the enemy and you resist him in James 4 7 it says therefore submit to God is it my will or is it your will submit to God and it says resist the devil and he will flee from you he will flee from you Submit yourself and the thoughts of your mind to the Lordship of Jesus in your life and you will find great victory and power. It is one thought at a time and it's one action at a time. And you will find that if you put into practice the things that are found in God's Word, you will be a changed man, a changed husband, a changed father, a changed woman, a changed wife, a changed mother. You will be victorious in the areas that you've been falling in because you will start to see and you will start to recognize the attacks that are coming They are from the enemy. Because all of a sudden, now wait a second, I know what God's Word says. I know what God's Word says. Sweet. When everybody and their brother has an opinion about everything and they think that they're right and they're the authority and everything's relative, I have my bearings. I have my compass. So as we submit ourselves and our thoughts of our mind to the Lordship of Jesus, there we find great victory and power. And from that place, we have the victory and we're able to continue in obedience to the Lord. And that's what we want. Because when we're in obedience to the Lord, we find God's blessings there. We're pleasing to the Lord. And even if we're going through a difficult time, we, we, we're, there's probably many of you that are struggling or going through something just because of the life that we live in this fallen world. But have you ever noticed how much better it is even when going through difficult times when you know that your heart is right with the Lord? Lord, I know this is hard, but I have that stability because I know that, we're, that I'm where I should be. And now in verse 6, Paul brings us full circle that if there are no signs of repentance and obedience to the Lord, he says that he's ready now in verse 6 to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 
Paul, as the spiritual authority, would use the spiritual weapons at his disposal to deal with those inside the church that were living in sin and disobedience to the Lord. Now, this is not something that pastors prefer to do. But because of the position that we are in, we have the responsibility before the Lord to address areas of sin. He mentions here in verse 6, when your obedience being fulfilled, really he wanted to give the church a chance to do the right thing. And by so doing, they'd naturally separate themselves from those that made decisions to obey the Lord, from those that made their decisions to disobey the Lord. Where are we at today? Where are we at? I don't know where you're at. You do. The Lord does. Maybe your husband or wife. Maybe some of your friends. Which side of the line are you on? Are you the group that is in obedience to the Lord? Or are you in the group that's in disobedience to the Lord? Because punishment would come upon those that were continuing to do that which is wrong. And we may be able to fly under the radar. We may be able to continue in sin and nobody knows about it. Or we might say, hey, prove it. There's no proof that I'm doing it. But if you're in sin, God knows. And it's much better to be corrected and to repent from your sin than to have God fall on you. You don't want that to happen. You do not want that to happen. Having to deal with Issues in the church is a very unfortunate part of the ministry where you have to correct and even discipline those that are living in habitual sin. Because really, sin that isn't dealt with cannot stay compartmentalized because sin spreads and it affects every area of our life. So big picture as Paul's addressing the church, sin affects other people in the church. Sin affects your spouse and your friends and your family and the people that sit on your right and your left and your front and your back at church. All of a sudden, people start to hear about it. And then they start hearing other people's own narratives of what's really going on. And then you start to see that Satan loves to cause division. And he loves to wreak havoc. And he loves to hurt people and tear people apart. He loves for people to believe gossip and to start talking behind other people's backs. And if you go all the way back, to the very beginning, it was a thought that came into the mind that wasn't taken into captivity. It was not subjected to the lordship of Jesus in that person's life and they acted upon it. See, being tempted isn't sin. It's when you start to fantasize and think about how I can act upon that and then carry that out. Going down to the micro level, your life, your family's life, if you do not deal with sin in your own personal life, it will affect your family. You might think nobody knows about it. It's secret and whatever it may be. It could be a million different things. Maybe you feel trapped. Maybe you've gotten to the point in your life where you said, I've tried to let go of this, but I've found now that it's holding me. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. What are the lies of Satan that you've been believing? That this would make you happy? That this is what you really want? That this will be the very thing that you've dreamed about? If you're living in the center of God's perfect will, let me tell you, Satan wants you out of that area. He wants you out of the center of God's perfect will. He might even say, hey, I'll take it easy on you. And maybe the sleepless nights that you're having, I'll let you sleep through the night. I'll take it easy on you. Maybe it'll be easier at work if you just turn your back on Jesus or tone it down. Stop being so much like Christ. Stop believing in what the Bible says. Listen, Jesus said that Satan is a liar. He's the father of all lies. When he speaks, he speaks from his own resources. So if Satan wants to lure you out of the center of God's will and you think that it will be better there, let me tell you, he wants you out of there so he can destroy you. So be aware of those things. This is a very serious subject today. And you're like, you're telling me, man. You're telling me. I thought we were going to come today and sing Kumbaya with the guest speaker. What in the world? Better check the bulletin when I see a guest speaker here next time. 
This is a powerful thing. Because it's not rocket science to see that there are Christians that are falling by the wayside. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. And maybe some of you are tiptoeing the line of falling by the wayside. Maybe for years now, you have believed a lie and you can't get over it. And it's like just a, it's a record that just keeps playing over and over and over again. Would you please look at your thoughts and compare them to what God's Word says? Is there unforgiveness in your life? Are you believing a lie? Is there a fortress? Is there a stronghold in your life? that needs to be torn down, it can. We must recognize the power of the flesh and not give into it because we have the power of Almighty God available to us. You can have the victory. That's the hope for today. That's the message of what we're looking at this morning. That you can find victory. You can have victory in your mind. And those thoughts can be thoughts now as you're filling yourself with God's Word. You're meditating upon those things which are lovely that are good, that are just, that are pure, that are of good report. Those things that build up, they don't tear down, they please God, they don't displease God. And so today, as we close with prayer, I'm going to invite you, if you're here this morning, and you're living in habitual sin, means it's a habit, and it's something that you're doing every single day or very often, and you're not finding victory, that today you could confess your sin and find forgiveness and find victory. We don't need any more Christians falling. Please. These are the last days. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? It's not worth it. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. If you're squirming in your seat right now, good. The Lord's speaking to you. If your heart's beating out of your chest, you have two options. You can either come to the light and say, Lord, I have sin, would you forgive me? Or your alternative is to go into a deeper depth of darkness. That's it. See, when I lived, I used to live in Hawaii. I lived in the island of Maui. You know the whole suffering for the Lord thing. And I was there, and because of the tropical region, I don't know if you've been there, you probably, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some people who've been there, lived there, been on vacation, but uh, because of the tropical nature of that region, bugs are huge. These are big bugs. There's centipedes over there, like 12 inches long, you know, and they're, they're just massive, and they're poisonous, and they bite, and they have armored shells. They have cockroaches that are really, really big. I mean, they're so big that you could kind of like skateboard down the street with them, you know. They're huge. And we had a problem in my, my uh, man cave with a couple of my buddies, and we lived in an apartment where underneath the kitchen sink, there was always these cockroaches that would be in there. And we always had to kill them. And the interesting thing was, if the kitchen light was on and the doors were closed, they were in darkness. The moment we opened them to get a dishwasher tablet out or whatever to put in the dishwasher, whatever it might be, the light would shine in that area and they wouldn't just run, they would try to hide themselves in the shadows. Oh, behind the Clorox wipes or whatever it might be, they would go and they would hide. And see, that's what happens to us when the light of Jesus shines on an area of your life and you don't come to the light and say, Lord, I need forgiveness. Lord, I need help. You have to go to another place that is shady, that is dark, and you have to retract yourself back and you find yourself in a worse position than you were to begin with. And so this morning... If you have an area of your life where you need to confess sin to the Lord, I'm going to give you that opportunity. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus and you showed up on this one day because your grandma said, I want you to come and hear Pastor David. And he's not here. And your grandma was really upset that I was here. Know that This message is for you that you can find forgiveness of sins and that you can have a personal relationship with the God who created you. And that no matter how strong the addiction, no matter how long 
You've been in that habit that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. 